Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning back into the Inspire Health podcast. And today we are bringing back a detox veteran, Spencer Feldman. We had Spencer on the show, gosh, a little while back. I think it was episode 128. So I'll put up a link for that. Everybody should check that one out because we went into detox pretty deep and covered a lot of real basics that you'll want to go back and look at. But just as a reminder, Spencer is the founder of Remedy Link. And that's been going on for, I think, the last 20 years, right, Spencer? I think we're coming up on 25 now. Jason. Holy cow. Yeah. Um, they formulate and manufacture detoxification products for doctors and their patients. This company specializes in helping support your body's natural response to heavy metal toxins, but even well outside of heavy metal toxins, as you'll hear in the first episode. Spencer now is in his 50s, lives with his partner completely off grid on a 100 acre farm where he spends his time tending to his orchard, garden, and designing new products to help detoxify people. So, Spencer, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, Jason. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I was mentioning earlier, we had some really good feedback after your first episode, and especially some of the stuff around the toxic crystals that we talked about. So um, oxalates and some of that stuff. So I had some really good feedback on people that we're going to start to segue them, I think, into a really positive direction. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to have you back on. We chatted about lots of stuff in the last episode, and we kind of teased a little bit on a couple of other topics. So I wanted to bring you back to make sure we could flush those out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But maybe initially, we can do a, a sort of short recap on some of the main detox traps that people get stuck in, because we haven't gone into that yet in this series specifically, and I think that's a really important one for people to be aware of. So why don't I pass it over to you, and you can chat about the detox traps that people need to be careful of. Right. And, you know, this is also uh, something that um, practitioners who are just starting their practices might want to be aware of, because these are traps that they can fall into as well, if they're not aware of them. So the first, so, all right, we live in a toxic world. Uh, okay, no need to get freaked out about it. But we do need to be mindful, just like you change the oil in your car, you just do some basic maintenance. And as we're detoxifying, the challenges are um, detox is a, is a very profitable word to advertise. And so a lot of uh, manufacturers jump on a bandwagon uh, with products that either aren't well designed uh, or are actually going to cause problems. Uh, and it's a very loosely defined term. So you have to understand what detox is. And what detox is, is taking something in the body that shouldn't be there and taking it out. It, you know, and some detoxes, you know, you might buy something that's a detox and really all it is is something that, that's a diuretic and makes you pee a lot. Uh, or um, something that gives you some fiber. So a properly designed detox requires you to be an educated consumer. And let me go through some of the traps that you might fall into if you haven't been in this industry for a while. And the first one would be an incomplete detox. Now, detoxification of chemicals has three phases. In phase one, you get the stimulation of cytochrome P450 enzymes, uh, with, uh, which is what a coffee enema does. Uh, and what that does is it <clears throat> puts an oxygen molecule Simple, I'm simplifying, but it puts an oxygen molecule on a toxin. And then phase two comes along and adds something to that oxygenated molecule. So it, it's sort of like a two-step process. First, you oxygenate it to kind of put a little place to grab on, and then you bind to it. And you bind to it with things like glutathione and glucuronic acid and um, certain B vitamins and certain amino acids, uh, sulfur. Uh, there's any number of things you can do to bind to it, depending on what it is your binding to that's phase two and then phase three is when it leaves the body so typically you either want to urinate it out uh, or you want to defecate it out and what will happen is in, a, in, in an incomplete detox you will someone will trigger phase one but um, not phase two or three or they can trigger phase one and two but not phase three you need all three of them and so here's what will happen um, let's say someone does a coffee enema because, or they take some supplement that stimulates phase one well, the body will respond by oxygenating the toxin to make it, to give it like a grappling hook place to bind to, but that temporarily makes it more toxic. And as if you do phase one without phase two, you now have a more toxic chemical in your body. And this is what happens to people with multiple chemical sensitivities. They can do phase one, but not phase two. And so their bodies actually take the toxins they're exposed to and amplify them. So when someone with multiple, chem multiple chemical sensitivity goes into an elevator with a bunch of people and one's wearing too much cologne, everyone, is else, everyone else can take that cologne toxin and phase one, phase two, get it out. 
the multiple chemical sensitivity person can do phase one, crashes on phase two, and now they're more toxic and then they feel that reaction. So the first thing is you have to understand that you have to do a complete detox. If someone crashes on phase three, it's not as bad as phase two um, because no one is completely blocked on phase three. I mean, obviously people can urinate and can defecate, can defecate but if someone is slightly um, suppressed on phase two or phase three, that toxin will hang around longer. And you know, even a detoxified toxin is still mildly toxic. So you want these things to leave as soon as possible, right? So uh, one of the things we did is um, in addressing this issue, we made a product called Xenoplex and it's a mixture of organic coffee, uh, which is phase one, and then every conjugate I could find for phase two. So we would simultaneously give them phase one and, and phase two at the same time. And that's what I used to get rid of my own multiple chemical sensitivities that I had for years. <clears throat> if I was stuck behind a diesel truck and I breathed it in, I was just a mess for hours. Um, or if I was around chemicals, you know, I couldn't pour gasoline into a lawnmower without feeling ill. Now it's no big deal. You know, um, I hardly even notice it. I don't want to do it, but I'm not sick from it. Uh, so uh, an incomplete detox would be phase one without phase two. And if you're going to do the, if you're going to do coffee enemas, um, either I would say try our Xenoplex suppositories because you can get the same effect directly with suppository. That's take half an hour uh, in a bathroom on your side. But if you're going to do a coffee enema on your own, then go do at least do some glutathione. Uh, the, the challenge with glutathione is you can't take it orally. Um, so yeah, you know what I would do is if I were going to do a coffee and I would probably mix glutathione into the coffee enema. Uh, if you want to kind of DIY home squad, uh, do it at home. Um, we can talk more about phase two in a little bit, too, uh, phase three in a bit. Um, another issue would be uh, someone using toxic products. So this is someone who uses, say, zeolite and chlorella that came from a toxic location. Zeolite will absorb all sorts of toxins. And this is why we want, this is why it's good for us, but it also is absorbing them from the earth in which it's mined. So if you don't acid wash your zeolite or have it lab tested and know that it came from a place that there was no toxins or it was mined, you can take the zeolite uh, and then end up with huge amounts of toxins in your body. And the same for chlorella. If you get chlorella that was growing out in an industrial weight, uh, uh, off uh, if you get it out in the oceans near China, where the industrial sludge is coming out, then that chlorella is completely toxic. And what you have is someone will go like a practitioner and will say, take this zeolite, take this chlorella, and then they'll check your urine and they'll say, wow, look at all these toxins coming out. And you'll say, yeah, but I feel terrible. And they're like, stay with it. No, um, that was the toxins you were putting in with a bad product. So, you know, know the source of where you're getting things from. Almost everything is sourced out of China now. Um, so you really want to get you know, lab tests on the, on the ingredients you're using, or, you know, have a practitioner, you know, or a, a someone, a company that you trust that actually does the, the, the verification that the things are as clean as they're supposed, as they're being represented as. Um, so that's a, a toxic product is a second kind of uh, trap that people can fall into. Uh, you know, and the, 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 the health coach will say, keep going, keep taking it. You're, you're just having a detox crisis. You're having a Herxheimer reaction. You're having a healing crisis. So it's really important to distinguish what a healing crisis is and what a toxic reaction is. And in my experience, you shouldn't really ever get a healing crisis. A healing crisis is either a sign of a toxic product that you're using or a poorly designed incomplete detox. Because if I get somebody who's massively chemically sensitive and I give them some Xenoplex, I'll let them know ahead of time, look, first day, you're probably not gonna be very happy. You're not going to want to take it again. Trust me, take it again. Second day, you're still going to be unhappy, but it's only half as much. You're not going to want to take it again. Trust me, take it again. Third day, it'd be down to like 10%. And at the end of the week, it'll be done. So if you are really massively toxic, no matter how perfect the detox is, it's still not going to be comfortable coming out, right? But what you should, the way you can tell the difference between a toxic reaction and an incomplete detox and a really good, de and, and a true toxic, uh, a healing crisis, if that's the that we're going to use, is the healing crisis gets better day by day and shouldn't last more than a few days. Okay, that's, that's, your, that's, your, uh, that's, that's your acid test for that. Um, so another issue would be um, kind of bad science or not bad science, someone who's not at the cutting edge of science. So as an example for mercury, uh, mercury is a really nasty uh, element. It's horrifically toxic. We put it in fluorescent bulbs and and it's in our teeth and all sorts of places. It's kind of hard to avoid, it's in vaccines. Uh, and so how do you get it out, right? So 
people can get mercury out the wrong way. They can go to a dentist who doesn't, who uses like um, the wrong kind of drill and doesn't use a, um, a vacuum system and a dental dam. And then a person can end up far with far more mercury in their body from having it improperly removed and ever leaving it in place. Uh, there are people that are end up in wheelchairs because uh, uh, an uneducated dentist took it out in a way that was bad. So, you know, if you're going to have it taken out, have it taken out by a biological dentist. Anytime I go to a doctor, and it's pretty rare, I like to find somebody who's in their 50s, 40s, 50s, right? Not so young that they have, that they're still have all of the pharmaceutical advertising uh, in their head about those things, and not so old that, that they have, they're not aware of the up and coming information. As an example, if you ask, there was a study, I think it was in your country, in Canada, uh, where they asked oncologists if they would take their own chemotherapy. And the new doctors are all like, absolutely. And the old doctors who've been around would be like, never. And the longer they'd been in practice, the less likely they were to take that chemotherapy, right? So there's, there's a learning curve that you have to be in practice to see these things to happen. So if somebody in their 40s and 50s, they're still energetic enough to be on top of the research, and they're still old enough to be able to see through all the BS of, of, of sales pitches of people trying to sell them products that are going to hurt their clients. Um, okay, so what would you do for mercury? So first we were doing EDTA and DMPS and DMSA. The problem is it will redistribute, meaning, meaning it grabs onto the mercury, 90% of it might get escorted out and 10% will release it because it'll grab onto something else it wants even more than the mercury, like oxidized iron or in some cases chromium. So, you know, the the first thing people did was they were doing these basic chelators. EDTA is great, just not for mercury, right? Uh, and they would have redistribution problems to their clients. Then Andy Cutler comes along and says, well, let's dose based on the half-life. Let's make sure that they're continuously taking a chelator so that even if chelator that you took now drops off a of mercury, the chelator you take three hours later grabs it. And that was a fantastic brain uh, realization of Dr. Cutler. The only problem is you got to wake up, you have to take it every three hours or four hours, which means you're taking it twice in the middle of the night. And then, you know, sleep is important. Uh, and then comes along uh, a meramide with uh, Dr. Boyd Haley, and he came up with an ingredient that grabs onto mercury and never lets it go. And so that's the cutting edge of mercury detox. And that's the really, really the way you want to do it. Um, challenging ingredient to get because they're still in drug trials, uh, but a meramide is the ingredient you want. And that, that's the way to go for mercury. Um, if you want to do a, uh, testing, uh, you can do provocation testing where you take a little bit of some chelator and then check your urine, uh, because sometimes the stuff is hiding. You can also do hair tests. One caveat about hair analysis, don't just look for a zero or don't just look at the mercury level. If the mercury is hiding, but still causing problems, you'll see dysregulation in your other, um, elements. So you'll see your calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium all over the place. Even if mercury is fine, that's uh, a smoking gun that mercury is still lurking around. Spencer, that was an awesome recap. Uh, a lot of really great points there. I don't have a whole lot to add to that other than a couple questions and maybe one other thing. You talked about the detox reaction. So important. A lot of times people do not need to go through significant detox reactions. And you do hear that pretty commonly, like just kind of keep pushing through it, just keep pushing through it. And so many times people are just hurting themselves. Um, one thing I think that's good to remember around that though, is like what Spencer was talking about to discern the differences between some of those things. The other one that you could probably tie in there would be when, it, you know, I, like um, when you've developed addictions to certain foods and you mm. go through literally like a withdrawal, mm. when you go off of say, coffee if you've become sort of and you're sensitive and you become addicted to caffeine or if you become addicted to gluten or addicted to sugar or any of these types of things when you cut that out you will go through a little bit of a withdrawal process too so that's not always so comfortable so when you're going through a, a detox quote unquote if you're incorporating aspects of that where you are taking away or removing some of the key foods don't be surprised that that that's maybe going to play in there a little bit with how you're feeling, um, your energy, your mood, um, mm. achiness in the body. A lot of that stuff happens as you're clearing some of that stuff out. What, what, you, what have you found with that, Spencer? Well, you know what? Let me, I, let me get back to that one second because I forgot one detox trap and then I'll address that because you make a good point. Um, there is one other trap and the liver gallbladder flush is a classic example of this. Mm. Someone who does a liver gallbladder flush, classically, they're taking olive oil and Epsom salts and passing a bunch of green stones. 
Um, I'm not a fan of that because you can jam a stone up in the pancreatic duct. Uh, you can end up jamming other stones in places you don't want and, and creating alkali burns in the pancreas. Um, but it, it works. But what will happen is the people will be told, keep doing the liver gallbladder flush until all the stones are gone. What they don't realize is it can create false stones. When someone takes a liver gallbladder flush, the, the, the olive oil will react to make little green lumps. And so they keep making these little lumps thinking that they keep having stones and they keep doing the flush. And what they end up doing is blowing all their bile out. You're supposed to reabsorb 95% of your bile. It's expensive stuff for the body to make. So when you blast it all out, you're drying the liver out of all its bile, which is going to create the same, the very situation you were looking to reverse, which is it's going to create stones because now you don't have any bile, right? So uh, one kind of, um, it's called, I would call it a protocol loop where the protocol you're doing will create the problem that it's trying to fix, right? We make a product called Glitamins, which uh, is designed to support the body in melting gallstones so that it's not um, as um, dramatic as blowing a bunch of stones on your, you know, on your first gallbladder flush, but in time it will, uh, it can support the body to do uh, in that process, uh, without causing the loss of all the bile and uh, jamming a, a stone somewhere. And that's our Glidamins product. Now we had talked about, uh, so, all right, detox as a, um, a chemical, as a, as a withdrawal. So you mentioned two things. One is as things are leaving you. So for instance, if you stop eating oxalates, which I think is a great idea, um, then you can go through an oxalate dump and your urine turns cloudy and yeah, you don't feel good as all the oxalates are, these sharp crystals are flushing through your system. Yeah, for that one, you've just got to bear with it, right? Um, you know, when you're going through hell, keep going, right? But then there's another one, which is uh, what do you do for detoxing, quote unquote, the detox like of a, a, a opiates or something uh, or something you're addicted to, right? Um, now, and that takes us into the microbiome because the micro... Uh, the microbiome is responsible for regulating you. It's responsible for regulating all of your neurotransmitters, all of your hormones, all your antibodies. It runs the whole show. And it, we, have, we could spend an hour talking about the microbiome. And when the microbiome is, is functioning well, it will make any kind of um, drug detox more manageable. Uh, one, because it's helping managing your own, your own levels that can make all the I mean, the microbiome makes 500,000 different metabolites, at least 40% of your circulating blood molecules. So if it senses that your endor uh, endocannabinoids or endorphins or anything are getting to dangerous levels, it can make it for you and ease the path in for your, uh, for, you know, for your crashing down and resetting your, your hormonal levels. The other thing about the microbiome is that it, is that it, directly, it directly detoxifies your body. So um, you know, people think the liver is a detox organ. It is but it's the backup detox organ. The primary detox organ is your microbiome, right? Um, and so the liver, well, the li obviously the liver is gonna be working for things that you inhale, and, and, but if it's coming through your mouth, which is where most toxins are coming through, as opposed to your skin or your breath, your gut sees it first and your gut should be doing most of the detox. Your liver is there more for support. Um, but for most people, the liver is the main detox organ. Um, you know, some people will say, oh, I don't methylate. Oh, I don't have um, histamine uh, DAO enzymes. Oh, I don't detoxify this without the other. Your microbiome has a thousand times more genetic information than your own DNA does. Uh, and it has the ability to methylate. It has the ability to do all these things. So even if you have a genetic SNP, a genetic um, flaw where you don't process a particular chemical very well, your microbiome can do it for you. So don't, don't fret. Oh my God, I don't methylate. Your microbiome makes folate all day long if it's healthy. Oh my gosh, I, I don't, you know, I don't methylate. So I can't really get B12 properly in homocysteine. Your microbiome can deal with homocysteine. Your microbiome can deal with all of it. And it should be dealing with it. It is the primary, the primary uh, regulatory organ of the body. I love that, um, Spencer. That's actually a big pet peeve of mine is a lot of the um, genetic testing that goes on. I, I think it's great incorporate his information but you know i was doing i do a lot of the um the walsh approach for for mental health and we look at some of the key different um functional tests to kind of measure what's going on in different ways mm -hmm. and one of the conversations i've even had with with dr walsh before was around genetic testing around stuff and he said you know we're just not there yet like he goes one day we might be at a place where we we can really use that uh, as um, significant value. And he's not taking away from it, but just kind of putting it in its place. He said, there's been so much 
emphasis put on the genetic testing, especially around the methylation cycle, particularly. And he said, you know, you got to remember, like the body is always finding pathways to reroute around stuff. So even if you have a SNP, for that person, maybe it's a bigger deal. But for somebody else, that SNP might make very little difference. And they might have you know, 15 different ways that they can reroute Mm -hmm. around a problem. It's why I think like, sure, that's great. Look at it, but then still try to find functional tests to see at the end of the day, how's it actually playing out in your body? What's it feel like? Try these different things. I, I always think like, to me, it's like, kind of micromanaging the body when we get caught up in all of the little pieces. It's like, come on, like the body's got to be so much more wise and able to adapt yeah, yeah. to things than, than we give it credit for where it's like, oh, if I just give this, and you got to remember when you just give this, that might affect this in this way, but it might affect 10 different things in the opposite way. So, you know, I feel definitely like we're micromanaging. W- what I like about concepts like the microbiome, it's this huge system. Like you said, it's got way more genetic information than what we than what we have and it's got this ability to do so much of it it's on its own so it's like if we can kind of get that system back online again then mm-hmm. that system will start to kind of put everything else back in place so i guess then the next question would be what have you found when that when that when that is out of balance and a lot of people have messed up microbiomes maybe we can break down a little bit around what causes some of the big problems with messing up the microbiome in the first place? Mm-hmm. And then what are some of the best strategies that you've found that can help to start to correct Ooh. some of that imbalance? I know that's a big topic. Uh, that's, but an, that's a two hour talk, but let's, let's, let's see. If we, we can, we can chip into it and maybe we'll, um, we'll right. bring you back at a point to, to dive really deep into that one. Sure. Sure. So just, re- yeah. And to, to reaffirm what you're saying, remember the microbiome is a thousand times more DNA than you do. So is there anything wrong with the DNA test on your body? No, it's useful. Yes. But don't be like Ben Stiller and um, or what was, or, you know, he cuts out his prostate and what was the, uh, that, that woman who took off her breasts? I forget her name. Um, Angela, Angela Jolie, Jolie. Angela Jolie yeah. because they said, Oh, you've got this genetic thing. That's, that's 0.1% of your genes. The other 90, 999 parts are in your gut. So, you know, Yes, we, we got this scare phase and then now we can put it in a, in a, in a put it in, a, understand the value of it and, and understand we also need to know the genetics of your microbiome. Okay, so the microbiome. Uh, the microbiome is this 3.5 billion year old ally and symbiont with humanity that's been around and seen everything and, and wants us to, uh, when we, if we were eating a primitive diet, tubers and insects and all these things, we would be taking in these things called oligosaccharides, which are sugars we can't digest. But the microbiome can, that's what feeds it. So we've been uh, 800,000 years as you know humans, basically, and, and before that, as even before that, we have had microbiomes and we've been eating food and then the microbiome will then eat the stuff we can't eat, which is the uh, oligosaccharides, and then give us things in return, like short chain fatty acids, it was like one of the first things it learned, but because it's a symbiont, it realized the longer we live and the healthier we are, the better it is for it. So it learned all of these tricks to do for us. It's the ultimate up human upgrade. It makes you stronger, faster, smarter, heal quicker, age slower. It does more, it, if you, it is the strongest, most powerful, you know, the, the transhumanists, the posthumanists want to tell you that, you know, the next stage, uh, the, the greatest symbiotic relationship we're ever going to have is with, with AI. Not at all. We've already got an amazing symbiotic relationship with a microbiome that's 3.5 billion years old. And it can, it will offer you gifts you can't imagine. And you know, the things it's done for me and other people by, by recovering it. Um, so we lose it by doing things like, um, there's three ways we, we lose it, right? We're not eating primitive diets, so we're not getting oligosaccharides. Um, we're taking things on a daily basis, which are not good for it. That's glyphosates, which wreck it, uh, SSRIs, oral hormones, uh, you know, chlorinated water, uh, and anab- low levels of antibiotics in the meat, uh, artificial colors, I'm uh, sorry, artificial uh, sugars. So then we're downgrading it that way. And then there's um, kind of these, these uh, extinction level events, like these broad spectrum uh, antibiotics, like the fluoroquinolones, like Cipro and stuff, that'll knock out 50 plus percent of the species of the microbiome. And so people end up with a pathobiome. And so uh, there are, you know, simple tests you can do without a $500 stool test. You know, you should basically, you shouldn't ever need toilet paper. You should wipe it. There's nothing there. Um, you should have no gas. Your stool shouldn't smell, you know, I mean, and, and there's more, you know, if we do the two hour talk, we'll, I'll give you all of the, 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 the simple tests you can do at home to check your microbiome. 
you know, think about it, think about it this way. If I asked uh, someone to draw a tree, they would, you know, draw the, the ground level and then the trunk and then the branches and the leaves, but that's half the tree. The other half is underground, but we don't draw it because we don't perceive it because it's underground, right? But if a good orchardist goes and finds, you know, a leaf that's been parasitized or wilting, they're going to think what's wrong with the roots of the tree? What's wrong with the bacteria at the roots? What's wrong with the nutrition at the roots of the tree? That's what a good orchardist does. That's what a good doctor should do. And the roots of our tree, the half that we're not seeing is the microbiome. So some people say, oh, that was, you know, the gut is your second brain. No, no. Gut is your first brain. It was here before your physical brain was. Uh, all the neurotransmitters your brain uses, th those were neurotransmitters the microbiome invented. Bacteria invented all of these things for its own internal communication. And then we said, oh, serotonin, dopamine, that's cool. Let me see how I can use it. So it's the first brain. You know, um, so let's talk a little bit about. Um, so again, it's it's your major detox organ. It's your major inf it's your major immune system. It, it's what tells um, self from other people who uh, can't who don't know what's who have an immune system that doesn't know what self is that they, they get autoimmune problems. People that have an immune system that doesn't know what other is have weak immunity and don't fight parasites. And it's the microbiome's job to do this. And let me give you an example. Jason, could you could you take Bruce Lee in a fist fight? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Okay. You're invisible. Can you take him now? Yeah. Yeah. You punch him, you go walk up right up to him and that's it. Right. So invisibility is enormously strategic, right? All right. Parasites have been around for a nice long time and we can get into it more again later, but the, the, one of the main tricks they have is they become invisible by changing their surface proteins. So, you know, you can have the greatest, um, strongest immune system in the world. If the bug is invisible, like Lyme, you know, like cancer, if it, if it makes itself invisible, if it cloaks itself, with this, which is one of its main protocols, you can't fight it. And it's not the job of the immune system to uncloak parasites. It's the job of the microbiome to uncloak parasites. And once you uncloak them, the immune system is like cancer cells, Lyme disease, Epstein-Barr, herpes, get out of here. You know, you can see them now. It can, it can fight them. Can't fight, can't fight what you can't see. So uh, that's just like a, a, a little bit on the, on the microbiome. Um, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about um, emotions, you know, the idea of emotional detox, right? Yeah, I want to segue into that in just a moment here. What are your thoughts then on things like the FODMAP diet then? You know, okay. Because right. that's a big topic. It's like that's, yeah. that's a major diet. You get a lot of people on that saying this is going to essentially heal your food allergies and heal your gut problems and everything like that. Is there a place for it or because you've taken basically out the food source for the microbiome? Okay. So um, uh, here, here it is. Actually, uh, I make a product for the microbiome. Here it is. It's uh, eight oligosaccharides, eight different ones because you need a whole bunch. Um, recreating what you would eat if you were the world's most successful hunter gatherer of all time. <clears throat> right. And always, always got everything from an enormous area. Right. Um, the challenge with the FODMAPs or people that go to a carnivore diet, like uh, Jordan Peterson and such is a lot of people have a wrecked small intestine, right? They have SIBO, um, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. You're only supposed to have one 1,000th of the amount of bacteria in your small intestine as you do in your large intestine. The way it's supposed to work is uh, you, you take your food and the stomach acid um, just uh, sterilizes it. And then the bile breaks down any bacteria and the enzymes break down any bacteria that are there. And then the uh, giant migratory contractions that are supposed to happen all the time, you know, a couple of times a day, flush it all out your gut past a working ileocecal valve and you're good to go. However, if one of these systems isn't operational, the ileocecal valve leaks bacteria up, back up from the large intestine. You're, you're not digesting your food. You don't have proper enzymes. You don't have proper bile, blah, blah, blah. You, and you don't have transit moving because there's a special, there's like five different types of peristalsis, right? Some of them mix it back and forth. Some of it move it slowly while it's digesting. There's one that's like, okay, everybody go. And it just flushes everything from the mouth out. I mean, from the, from the, um, the stomach down, it just flushes it all out. And if someone eats late in the evening and doesn't do any kind of intermittent fasting, meaning you don't have at least 12 hours between dinner and breakfast, you may not ever get that flushing. And so you end up with food in the small intestine and where there's food. And this is like a law I've learned, right? If there's food, something will find a way, to, there, something will show up to eat it. 
No feast goes unwasted in nature, right? So if you've got food in there because you're not digesting it and you're not moving it through appropriately, bacteria will grow. Now, this is the FODMAPs issue. If you give FODMAPs, and this is completely loaded with FODMAPs, right? Um, if you give FODMAPs to someone with small intestine bacterial overgrowth, which is a percentage of the population, you're going to, fix, you're going to help them to support their large intestine, but you're not going to support their small intestine. The small intestine is going to have a very difficult time with this. So what do you do? If you give them no FODMAPs, their small intestine is happy, but their microbiome is messed up. Okay, now they have functionally no very little microbiome in their gut, in their large intestine. They'll have a meat-based microbiome, which is very limited and not what you want, right? Uh, and the other thing is, you know, for the people that are carnivores, consider this. If you only eat meat for 10 years and you burn out your meat digestion capacity, because we all have a limited capacity to digest all foods. If you burn that out in 10 years, because you've been eating 10 times as much meat as would be in an omnivore diet, then what are you going to do if you can't eat meat anymore? Then you can't eat anything and you've really painted yourself in a corner, right? So I applaud the people that who have figured out that they had a, a uh, pathobiome in their small intestine and that if they stop and me, they stop the FODMAPs that they can improve themselves. They haven't gone from a path, a pathobiome omnivore diet to a limited good microbiome diet. The goal would be to take them all the way and say, okay, now let's finish your healing journey and take you to a completely, um, com a complete healthy microbiome on an omnivore diet, which gives you the greatest, the largest microbiome with the greatest genetic library to do the greatest number of things to deal with the most amount of stuff. So what you have to do for these people is you have to, um, you have to give them the, there's a way to do it. We're not going to have the time to get it into it now. There's a way to deal with this. And there's a, there's a protocol where no, you don't give them FODMAPs for an initial point in time. And then you do in a very particular way. And then you clear out the small intestine of the bacteria. Then you're able to reintroduce it in a very particular manner. And then what you do is you've got the FODMAPs getting to the large intestine where they belong which is going to give you your microbiome. Does that answer that? Yeah, yeah, I think okay. that's good. And I, I know that's going to be into a bigger conversation. So it'll be something we'll kind of pull back in um, at another interview time and go through that in detail, because I think that's a really important one. And a lot of people have really messed up digestion and it's at the heart yeah. of so many problems. So, um, and, I and like 70%, I said- 70%, Jason, 70%. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I don't want to lose the thought. Uh, you know, when we do stool tests, what we find, 70% of the people have some degree of SIBO. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree. So. Yeah. Well, and, and you, you see more and more awareness around that. And we were talking about emotions and it's like, you even see people like, you know, like for example, like the NEMCHEC protocol or something where they basically look at trying to rebalance that small and large intestine bacteria. And, and th I mean, that's really designed more around things like ADHD, autism, this whole sort of spectrum of, of imbalances that can happen. And they're looking at all based around just trying to rebalance the biome for the most part. And they incorporate some high doses of, of uh, omega-3s and stuff like that too. But they use specifically just looking at, I'm just using that one as an example, uh, lots of different types of diets tied around trying to balance the biome. Um, that one specifically looks at sort of little bits of inulin and gradually trying to build that up. Sort of more like rather than doing probiotics, more trying to give food source for it to naturally start to create that balance. What are your thoughts on that? Anything you found with that? So, you know, inulin is a perfect example. Um, if you don't have good digestion, you're not going to break down inulin and you're not going to get what's in it. Yeah. Right. And then you'll get, get gas because something else will. So um, the oligosaccharide is a very deep thing. Um, it's something's missing from, mobile, from everybody's diet. And if you give it to somebody the wrong way, you could make it worse. So mm. there's, there's a proper way to do it. And uh, again, the trap is, um, your call between, uh, uh, the, you know, do I fix the large intestine or the, call, or the price of the small intestine? Do I fix the, fix the small intestine, the price of the large intestine? Do I try to balance them and fix them both a little bit? No, you fix them both and you have to have, understand the protocol has got to be very specific to do that. And you have to have a deep understanding of what's actually happening in the digestive tract and bacterial growth. And then you're like, oh, I see what we have to do. Okay. Nice. We'll bring you back. We'll do a, a big one on that. Cause I think that'll be a really important one to touch on. Now let's sort of segue in 
maybe first, how does microbiome specifically affect the psychology? So how people actually think and feel. I mean, a lot of times we think of gut health and we think about digestion and maybe even body aches and headaches and problems with uh, constipation, diarrhea, all this kind of stuff. But a lot of people aren't totally aware of the fact that that plays such an integral part of how we think, how we feel on it from a mental emotional standpoint. So what are your thoughts around that? How does that work how does how do we how does the microbiome affect that and then what are some of the ways outside of just the working with the microbiome how do we start to work with the emotionality of things sure okay so the microbiome like i said invented created all of the neurotransmitters you use that we use um and it is responsible for the production um maintenance and breakdown of your neurotransmitters to a large degree uh, you know, there's the microbiome. If you take all the endocrine uh, glands out of the body and put them on a scale and take all the endocrine glands in the microbiome, you know, you, they're about the same, maybe a little bit more actually in the, uh, in the endocrine, uh, in the gut. So you have more endocrine tissue in your gut than all of your, your, your glands combined. So it's an enormous player in your endocrine system. Um, when 90% of your serotonin is in your gut. Uh, so it plays a role obviously, cause it's creating, you know, dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, epi, you know, uh, serotonin, uh, it creates oxytocin, it creates these things, it regulates them and it breaks them down. So it, you know, it is responsible for maintaining your, um, your emotional poise, right? And it will always do better than to trying to take a drug and, you know, jacking it up and then lowering it down and trying to find center somehow. The microbiome manages it on a second, on a, you know, second by second, it's sampling your bloodstream to see how it needs to fix you. And again, why does it want to do that? Why would the microbiome care if you're in a good mood? Why would it care? Because the healthier you are, the longer it gets to live in your gut, where there's all of these oligosaccharides, assuming you're eating a primitive diet or taking a product and there's no oxygen, there's no predators, it's warm, it's moist, it's a perfect environment. It wants you to live optimally and optimally includes optimal neurotransmitters. Now you would think that the number one indication of a bad microbiome would be the gut. Actually not. My experience, that's actually maybe tertiary, maybe third. The number one indicator for me, like when someone calls me up on the phone and, and they want to get a product and I'm like, okay, well, you know, maybe that will work for you, but why don't you tell me what's going on? What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Okay, that's not what you want. This is, this is maybe a better path for you this way, right? And one of the giveaways that their microbiome is out of whack is just their mood. Like, how, how is your emotional tone? Are you happy and optimistic? Do you, have good emo do you have good emotional boundaries? Do you like yourself? Do you like other people? Are you generally a happy person? Um, that's the number one indication the microbiome is healthy. The second would be when the microbiome goes out, the mood goes out and then the second thing, and then uh, mental fog and then fatigue. And then finally, you know, then you'll also see, um, in digestion. So don't think of the microbiome as digestive. It's located primarily in the digestive system, but it is not primarily a digestive, digestive, uh, organ. It's primarily a regulatory organ, right? So, um, when we have good mood, good attitude, right? If you, if you are a, a compassionate person, uh, you're generating oxytocin and that will actually upregulate uh, the, the bacteria that um, create oxytocin in your gut and will keep your bacteria and your microbiome healthy. If a person is angry or fearful and they create adrenaline or noradrenaline um, then or cortisol, they're actually going to Rate, it's actually going to increase the amount of bad bacteria in their gut and cause the good bacteria to start becoming bad. So it goes, it's, it's a mutual cycle, right? If you have, if you have a good mood, then you cultivate good bacteria, which in turn gives you a good mood, which in turn cultivates good bacteria. That's the virtuous cycle. If someone's in a bad mood, it cultivates bad bacteria, which creates bad neurochemicals, which creates a worse mood. And that's the vicious cycle. So you can have the vicious cycle or the virtuous cycle, and you can turn it on a dime, you know? So you know, yes, there is going to be some momentum and we can talk about the momentum of neural pathways that you have to get through. If you have a bad, if you have some bad habits, mental habits, the other thing is no matter how positive you want to be, if the microbiome is sick, if someone has taken antibiotics and didn't breastfeed and had a difficult childbirth sequence and all these things, and their microbiome is wrecked, their pH, their stool pH is off, all these things, it's going to take a saint to be in a good mood. It is very, very hard 
to have clear mind and a happy and a happy heart if the microbiome is ill. So a lot of people overlook. Some people will say, oh, I have to, you know, I just have to choose to be happier. You know, the people that are promoting that kind of thing are people who have good microbiomes that don't understand the struggle of those that don't. So, yeah, um, yeah I would exactly. much prefer that before, you know, before we start putting people on psych meds, let's look and see what their microbiome is doing. Yeah, it's all really important. Um, how I've often thought about it is, I mean, they all completely intermix, but mm. it's, and sometimes it's like what started what, but yeah. how I look at it is I always think like, work on the on the physiology part because if there's something that's out of balance on the physiology part like you said it can be 10 times harder for that person to try to get into a a mood or a, or an emotional state that ultimately they probably really want to but mm -hmm. they just can't get there whether that's coming from the microbiome or, or other types of biochemical imbalances that are just pushing people into a different physiological state usually pushing mm -hmm. them more into like fight or flight and then it's very hard to be able to actually work with that so sometimes you can get that where you start to work on the physiology part. Then I always explain to people the next part is now if you've had dysfunctioning physiology yeah. for decades sometimes or for yeah. almost all your life, well now now you've developed a lot of habituation. I mean you've you've set in motion now certain neural pathways that's like this situation happens and I tend to react in this route. So mm -hmm. over repetition that's been now in, reinforced over and over and over again. So a lot of times even when then the physiology changes what I find is that they start to feel a little different inside. They get that a little bit more of an um of a dampening down of the intensity that they can feel. There's a little more space. But now they have to still work with the habituation that's developed mm. over the decades. So mm. from that respect, maybe we can jump over to there because I know you talked also about sort of the five elements and sort of tying into almost like how we can emotionally detox because I think those are really good pieces of information that bring awareness to when we are going into some of these patterns and mm. different perspectives on looking at it. So how do we work with it once we've even done the physiological work? Now, how do we work on that other aspect of it? Yeah, you know, that's a great point, Jason. Um, so would the, the, a lot of my products were created basically because either I or a dear friend was ill with something and I wanted to help them. And then I said, well, I can't just help them. It's other people, this product. And the panacea is no different. It was a very dear friend of mine. And she had debilitating chronic fatigue for two years and was, uh, you know, getting to the point where she need to live in, in home care. And uh, we turned her around and three days by getting her microbiome back online, which blew me away. Um, now, if you consider that a bacteria can go from one to 34 billion in 12 hours with a doubling time of 20 minutes, it does not take long to uh, get your microbiome back online. So, you know, the, the, the pad, the, that's very quick. Surprisingly, you can get the microbiome and then all the things it does for you turned around, you know, in days, even if it was years and years of illness mental pathways are a bit different. And, you know, they say it's something like 500 repetition, physical repetitions, I think, to, to make a physical memory, but 5,000 to undo it, right? So mm -hmm. uh, it takes longer to unlearn a bad habit than to create a good one. Uh, so when I was going through a challenging time in my life and having a difficult time um, with my mind and the thoughts, uh, I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to try to break it down into smaller bite-sized pieces rather than having this overwhelming thing that was my mind that I had to deal with, right? I, I didn't like the thoughts I was having. They weren't constructive. They weren't positive. They were looping. They were negative. They weren't serving me, you know? And so I said, all right, I need some kind of um, structure that I can break down all my thoughts into a bunch of different categories, figure out which ones are out of whack, and then hit them one at a time in, 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 in ways that I can measure them and in ways that I can, and in, in, in sizes that I can handle without being overwhelmed. And I came across, um, you know, the philosophy of the, the five elements, which uh, shows up in, in lots of different cultures. And the idea is that the world, the universe writ large, uh, has five basic kind of um, archetypal energies associated with it. Uh, air, fire, uh, earth, water, and space. And you could say that these would be respectively air would be um, like electricity and movement uh, fire would be uh, transformation so you know nuclear energy or fire or light would be fire uh, 
water is um, kind of like this hypnotic uh, flowing uh, thing. So that would be dreams in, ter um, uh, in terms of uh, from uh, earth would be gravity, would be, this, would be form and structure and space would be the vacuum, right? And you can see that uh, these things, uh, so like water would be like vortexual and, vortexual and centrifugal force. Um, you can see these things, you know, at, at galaxy level, you could see them at atomic level, you could see them playing out at biologic level, you can see them at social levels, and you can see them in the mind. So I find it a useful analogy. Uh, so for instance, um, in, in animals, right, uh, air would be the flight response, fire would be the fight response, uh, earth might be the hoarding, like for squirrels gathering nuts, um, water would be uh, sex and sleep, and uh, space would be um, the freeze reflex of what happened just before an animal possibly dies and gets disemboweled by a line so it doesn't feel any pain, right? So this, these same energies show up. And at the psychological level, they would show up as fear for air, uh, anger for fire. Uh, water is a little bit tricky because it's a couple of things. Water is uh, sort of dream, fantasy, sensuality. Earth is, uh, you might say, um, attachment and greed, you know, money. And then space would be apathy. And so you know, what I did is I looked at myself and I said, all right, in what way am I representing these elements in a negative way? And in what way do I need to make them? And how can I make them positive? How do I purify them for lack of a better word? And so, you know, what you can sit down and ask yourself is what are you afraid of? Right? What are you angry about? What or who haven't you forgiven? Right? Um, what are you attached to? Right? If you were to die right now and leave float over your body, what things would you be like, oh, no, my, my career, or my house, uh, my bank account, you know, what physical things are you still attached to? Water would be in what way aren't you honest, either with other people with deception with yourself, right? Or, you know, what are you daydreaming about? Like, oh, gosh, I really wish I, you know, if you have this constant daydream that you're this other kind of person, that's an imbalanced water element. And space element would be in what things have you given up on? What have you become apathetic on? And the idea of the five elements would be, um, so there's, there's a couple of things to do, right? Um, at a, and if you're interested, there's, um, if you go to spiritualsecretagent.com, the book that I'm quasi, um, uh, summarizing now is called purifying purification of the five elements. And it's there. It'll express it in more depth. So there's a couple of things that you could consider doing, right? Um, it, one thing is you can watch your internal narrative. And so for instance, if you find yourself using words like, well, I'm really afraid of this, or that's really scary, uh, and either in your language to other people or in your self-talk, you can choose a different word. You could say, wow, um, that's concerning. Like, wow, I'm so afraid of what's going to happen with COVID or Ukraine. I'm like, yeah, you know, that, that, that war is concerning, right? You don't want to say, oh, I'm not afraid of that at all, unless you aren't, because that wouldn't be uh, that would be disingenuous. It wouldn't be authentic. And you also don't want to go the other way, like, oh my God, it's so scary. I want to run for a, fall a fallout shelter today, right? So you don't want to suppress these negative emotions, but you don't want to indulge them. You want to gently move them towards a healthy manifestation at a level that's honest, at a level that's authentic and sustainable. So, you know, there's, a, there's uh, unfortunately, there's an, a large number of people in the um, positive thought movement who've committed suicide. Right? The ones who will say, only think positive, only think positive, and then they go and kill themselves. Well, they're obviously in the positive thought movement because they're wrestling with inner demons. And that's what they found is just think positive. What they didn't understand is they, did, they, they were too extreme. They weren't authentic. It wasn't sustainable. And then when they weren't dealing with that energy by just trying to suppress it and it finally bounced back at them in a monstrous level, they took their own lives. So, you know, it's not like serenity now, serenity now when you're angry. No, when you're angry, it's wow, well, that's inconvenient. It might be darn inconvenient. It might be really inconvenient, but it's inconvenient, right? You're not saying, you're not allowing yourself, you're taking some of the edge off the anger. You're saying, no, I'm not going to indulge in anger if I can, if I can manage, right? You might not be able to, but I'm not going to pretend it's not there. It's inconvenience, right? And how powerful does that make you? What is the, the, the implication when something, when someone does something that's really outrageous and you respond with, well, that's inconvenient, what the, what the subconscious message is, is that you're so powerful that would make someone, that something that would make someone lose their cool 
you find an inconvenience, something that would make someone else get completely afraid is for you. It's a concern. It's something to be mindful about. So I'm going to give you some language that works for me, Jason. You guys can come up with words that you like. If I find myself fearful, I'll say, oh, um, I, that, that's something that I should be mindful of. I'll pay attention to that. If I'm really angry, I'll be like, well, that's an inconvenient, an inconvenient thing that's happening. If I really am attached to an outcome, boy, I really wanted this thing to happen in this way, and it happened in a different way, you know, I will say I have a preference for something. I really prefer that the concrete work that's getting done today is done well. I prefer that, right? If I'm really attached to it and end up with cracks in the concrete, I'm going to set myself up for being pissed, uh, inconvenienced later. Yes. Um, okay. So you can have preferences because we do have preferences, right? There's a, there's a trap in a lot of the Eastern school philosophies that say you should get yourself to emulate a stone and meditate for, for, you know, facing a wall for 13 years in a cave and have no reactions to things. No, that's another trap. That's the space element getting out of whack. That's someone who was so overwhelmed by the difficulties of having a mind and having emotions that they said, I'm out of here completely. That's not wisdom. That's escapism. Right. So um, the space element trap is the one that I see people who just want to nullify themselves fall into. And so, but let's go back one. So there's uh, uh, the for, for earth element, it's preferences for water element. Um, that can come out as really intense sadness. Um, uh, so if you're experiencing a great deal of heartache or depression or sadness, you know, find a word. You could be like, wow, that's uh, that's unfortunate. That's um, that's a bummer. You know, find something a little less than heartbreaking, but still honors the fact you're going through a sad experience to some degree. And if you're feeling like completely apathetic about something, then what you could do is you could say, um, yeah, I'm, 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 I, need a, I need a little bit of detachment from, uh, from that for a moment. Uh, I'm feeling a little, um, I need a little perspective, you know, uh, yeah. Um, but the purification of the space element would be, all right, so let's talk, are we, how are we on time? Because I'm seeing like, we're good. Okay. So if we're going to yeah, purify these, okay. So then, then, so you want to change these now in the beginning, you might not catch it as it's happening. You might only afterwards say, Oh, I got angry fire element. Oh, you know what? I was not honest with that person because it made me seem like a better, right. Or it's more convenient not to, not to be completely honest with them. Water element got me or wow. You know what? I just didn't really act compassionately with that person. Uh, space element. So you might, the goal is to catch it in the moment as it's happening. That's probably not going to happen for, you know, for a little while for most, it didn't happen for me for a few months, I had to catch it. And what I would do is I would catch it sooner and sooner until I caught it in the moment. And it's not just saying these words, the words are a reminder for the feeling you're trying to cultivate. It's the feeling you're trying to get to, right? So, and then eventually you get to the point where the purification of air what is it when you have no fear? Well, that's called faith, right? So you can say, what do I fear? Oh, well, I really fear this, that, and the other. And then try to cultivate some faith. And this isn't done with reason, right? If you had a reason why uh, you shouldn't be afraid, then you already wouldn't be afraid of it. So faith is unreasonable. It's a decision that you make in the face of reasons why you should do something and you choose another illogically, right? And it's a choice you make. Now, if you were to cultivate the faith of, okay, I don't know how the situation that is um, concerning to me is going to be okay, but I believe it will. And in terms of anger, the purification of that would be to go back in your mind and just, who do I need to forgive? Oh, geez, my parents did this, my ex-wife did that, my kids just did this, my business partners did that. And then just to sit with it and be like, okay, you know what, they, life's hard. Um, I would have preferred right? I would prefer that they behave differently. I'm sure I didn't behave perfectly. And I can forgive them, you know, because I don't want to carry that anger with me, right? And then when you get to uh, the water element, you know, what is it that you have to be in flow with? What do you have to let go of? Oh, my God, I can't believe I lost this. I lost this thing that the water took it from me. And I'm so sad. I lost this relationship. I lost. Okay, all right. And just let that go and realize that, you know, the world's abundant more will be given, probably something that's better for you. And the, one of the things I find useful with the water element is, okay, no matter how sad I am right now, it's temporary. 
I will get over it, even though I don't feel like it because the water element is very hypnotic and gets you feeling like I'm sad now. I've always been sad. I always will be sad. And your whole world is this bowl of sadness. No, it's a bowl this big. You know, it'll probably be over in 20 minutes and you'll be off into another emotional scene because these, um, if we get into it more deeply, the emotions, as you cycle through them, you go through each emotion over the course of an hour, you go through all five of them in different time frames. And when you learn what the timing is, you can actually watch yourself have emotions on a clock happening. And that's when you start to realize I'm not having the emotions. The emotions are having me. And I need to learn how to, how to better work with these energies that are, that are coming through me, that are cycling through in the universe. Um, the purification of the earth element would be, okay, you know, um, you could do that with a charity and you can do that with just acceptance. Like, all right, I release, I accept, which is part of the spiritual path of the Eastern traditions, but it's just one element of that. It's just, okay, I can release that. I can let that go. I can imagine I'm, you know, leaving my body right now and okay, there goes my body and there goes my bank account and there goes all the physical things I've accumulated. And that's okay. You know, wherever I go, if I need to create something else, I can. And the purification of the space element would be not to, you know, say I'm done with humanity and all these crazy humans and, and go into a, a catatonic spiritual state. The, 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 turn, the, the purification from my perspective would be after you master all the first four elements and you get them to the point where your mind is calm and you're experiencing the space element, come back, come back and serve. Don't just sit there in meditation three hours a day, which you could do and bliss out in your energy currents, you know, go and come back and come back into the world and, you know, realize you were here, you, you chose to be here or brought here for a reason. Why are you here? What's your purpose? How are you meant to serve? What are you best at doing? And because too much space element has a very corrosive effect. It can leave people in a, a um, existential crisis, which you'll see in the spiritual community with a lot of people. They, they lose their reason for being. So you have to come back to serve, and, that's gotta, and you have to have the reason. So that's sort of like an intro to the five elements from my perspective. Yeah, that's beautiful, Spencer. I'll put a link for the book on there too so that people can download it and, um, and go over it because it's got a lot of good pieces. I mean, I like stuff that also gives you practical doables you know because sometimes especially the world emotions when people start to feel it i mean most people like in an instant are overwhelmed by emotions and unless you've you've practiced with it you know you've kind of wrestled with it yourself um and come out the other side th then you know the process and you like you said it's it's impermanent i think that's a really important part you realize that as much as it could be intense and even the suffering that you're feeling at that moment in time can be intense you realize that it's not permanent, you know, and you do come out of it. And I think I, what I always remember is it's like the, the neurotransmitters have a cycle, you know, this neurochemistry we create, it, it gets broken down, it gets, it gets, it dissolves and it gets, it moves on. All of those molecules of emotion have a time frame that they take and then they get metabolized. So if you can kind of stay, I think that's a really important part. We were talking to another guest and he was talking about the importance essentially of faith trust and surrender and and those those in many ways can can work wonders for a lot of people and i think the different pieces you talked about are really important right now too and it makes me think at the moment like what would you say just collectively looking at like what would be the imbalances that you see kind of perceived almost as like humanity as a whole right at the moment and everything we are going through mm -hmm. where do you see the big imbalances and what do we need to sort of collectively find balance with? Because I look at them and I think, gosh, like, you know, compassion and honesty and <laughs> forgiveness and faith. And I mean, there's a lot of, I kind of think in a lot of ways we could be all over the map on it, but from your perspective on that, what do you think are some of the biggest imbalances collectively we're going through that we maybe need to, to start sure. to find harmony around? So, um, I probably have the distinction of taking more, taken more oxytocin than any human being in the history of the planet. <clears throat> uh, I bought grams of oxytocin and made it as a nasal spray and I took it for six months. Uh, I was a mid forceps delivery and my mother was told by her father because she was pretty, she should never touch me because it would give me an edible complex. So I never got oxytocin. My system never formed properly and I never learned how to socialize properly and had all these uh, 
side effects as a result of that. And six months taking oxytocin was like three lifetimes of, of therapy. Um, I, I was able to go back through my life and be like, oh, that's why all those things happened the way they did, because that was the perspective I had. The challenge with the neurochemicals is there's an unfair half-life. So what I mean by that is the nasty ones, right? and I get into this in another one of the books, it's called the, the Four Gifts, where I talk about how, you know, the neurochemistry of long-term romance and how to, some ideas on how to try to be with one person happy for a long time because genetically um, we're geared towards multiple partners and moving the genetically, well, I'm not going to get into the genetics of what happens for men and women and how that moves us away from the Disney-esque idea of happy, happily ever after, but the genes don't want happy, happily ever after. The genes want genetic diversity. And so how do we get to happily ever after? And it's about managing your neurochemistry and your partner's neurochemistry together. So there's an unfair thing about the neurochemistry and that is the dark neurochemicals have a longer half-life than the good one. The good one, the main good one, is, uh, is um, oxytocin. It's the angel on one shoulder, but it breaks down in a few minutes. Um, the, the ones that make you unhappy, the cortisol, the one that makes, makes people look at Bambi and think dinner, um, that can take hours you know, to, break, to break down in somebody. Uh, and you know, as we shift into a more cortisol dominant culture, because uh, for a couple of reasons, well, first off, if you're going to try to manage your cortisol, remember it's a glutocorticoid, it's a, it's a glutocorticoid, so it gets stimulated by hunger. So don't, you know, if you want to choose intermittent fasting, that's great. And if you're not intermittent fasting and you haven't gotten to that point, every time you get grouchy and, and you get a cortisol spike, it could be hours before it breaks down, partially depending on your diet and genetics and your microbiome. So what's happened is um, we have eaten a lot of soy oil as a species, I think one third of the diet is now soy oil when it comes to oils. Soy oil destroys oxytocin in the brain. So we have one third of the kids being born cesarean, which means they're not getting the oxytocin bonding to begin with, right? We have uh, one third of our diet is oxytocin. So the oxytocin is left being destroyed. So we are an oxytocin. And unlike primitive primates that are constantly grooming each other, we don't have a touchy feely culture, right? Normally when you, you know, a thousand years ago, when you talk to somebody, they were right there in front of you. You could shake their hand, you could gaze in their eyes, you could, you know, give them a back rub or a, a thousand years, two, 10,000 years ago, years ago, you could groom them, you know, checking their hair and their skin for ticks and things. And that grooming is how we are genetically programmed to get oxytocin. So we are a touchy feely species. You can't do that on Facebook. So our, our toxic diet, our poor birthing sequences and our social culture have made us an oxytocin deficient cortisol rich species that has become very toxic. Uh, what's the way out of that? You have to learn how to start cultivating oxytocin. You can take it as a nasal spray. Um, don't take the homeopathics, get the real thing. Um, and also you can do that with a partner. And that's one of the nicest things about having a partner is you can manage each other's oxytocin levels, right? And the first book talks about a bunch of ways to lower cortisol and raise oxytocin. So yeah, that's where we are as a species. We have the angel on the shoulders shrunk and the devil has increased. And that's why I believe we are such a um, psychopathic and war loving species destroying its environment at the moment because we don't have a lot of compassion uh, neurochemistry being cultivated. Yeah, it's, um, it's, but at the same point, it's something that is very correctable. You know, all of this stuff is correctable, right? So, but it's like uh, we went through here for the past hour and a bit. It ultimately, I would say, comes back to that same message that it starts with each individual on their own first. Correct your own stuff so that you start to sit in a better place um, in your own life. And then that starts to kind of create change by change as we stretch it out. So I think when we, before we want to correct and fix the world, let's first look and do an honest inventory. It's like that step four in the... Um, in the AA protocol. I think that's, uh, I think you even mentioned something close to around that where they talk about sit down and have a fearless moral inventory of your life. You know, mm -hmm. if we can sit down and do that, I feel like there's so much healing when we can sit down and, and have that fearless, 
honest look at our own lives without constantly, it's easy to pick out what's wrong with other people's lives, but if we can do that to ourselves and sort of with that place of compassion and honesty and fearlessness, I, I think that's such a beautiful place to be able to start because we, we start to correct that. Use these different tools, correct the physiology, and then you'll kind of find that these other pieces start to fall into place when we um, have the willingness, I think, to just begin. Yeah. Um, you know, when you recognize the, the elements in yourself, when you can recognize, oh, fire, air, element, uh, mm -hmm. anger, fear, you know, um, sadness, when you recognize it in yourself live. Um, so I, there's a couple of invitations that I, I talk about in the book. One is your brain will invite you to a certain narrative. The invitate and because you've got the neural pathway there and you're going to have to break down that neural pathway and create the new one and that does take more time than fixing the yeah. microbiome so every time you say to yourself i'm yes i'm going to be mindful of that yes that is inconvenient you are forging burning create not only are you creating a new pathway you are by denying the attention to the old pathway letting it break down and eventually you'll go away and so the first invitation is where you decline the invitation of your brain for the current narrative that you have and that media promotes to us because fear and anger sell, right? You pay more attention when you're outraged and afraid of things. Mm -hmm. So you deny that and you come up with a new, uh, a new narrative. And the next one comes when someone comes and they talk to you and they say, wow, did you hear about X, Y, Z? Isn't that terrible? And you decline that invitation yeah. and you say to yourself, yeah, that's inconvenient. Yeah, that's concerning. And if you feel like you've got it mastered enough, then you can start to do it for the other person. You can not only decline their invitation, but you can invite them. You could say, wow, yeah, you know, that is inconvenient. And they're like, what do you mean inconvenient? That's yada, 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 yada. And they say, well, yes, but I prefer to use the word inconvenient and here's why. And you can invite them. They may or may not take you up on the invitation. You, but you can invite them to a different way of thinking about it. I don't like to feel angry. I don't feel like it. Um, I feel like it gets, you know, I feel sick from it. It lasts for a couple of hours. It doesn't make me any more effective at dealing with the thing. So I don't want to ignore it, but I want to choose this kind of response. And, you know, often what you'll hear, you'll hear is, like, oh, yeah, well, I don't know if I could do that. And you're like, yeah, you know, um, just have a preference for it. It takes mm -hmm. time. And just, you know, be gentle with yourself if you, as you're working this, because you've got the, the weight of maybe 50 years of pattern of that, that flywheel has been turning for 50 years in that pattern. Yes, you, it's going to take some time, but six months into it, and you will be able to rewire the brain and you will get to the point where, you know what, you find that it's now doing it for you. You don't, you don't even have to say, wait a minute, no, that's just inconvenient. No, that's just a preference. It just, your mind gives you that narrative and now your mind is helping you. It's reminding you, hey, don't take that so seriously that you get really upset, but don't ignore it because it's something to pay attention to. And then your mm -hmm. mind becomes your friend, ra friend rather than a monkey on your back. <clears throat> it's, um, it's a really powerful exercise that, that really starts to put you back in control of your body again, because uh, emotions in a lot of ways can really pull us totally out of control. Like you, you really feel like sometimes something else kind of jumps in and, and takes over for a period of time. I, I know what's helped me with that is even learning to just stay with sensation in my body with, without the having to try to make a thought process tied to it or the storyline that's tied to it or the, the judgments wrapped around it, just make it very physical. So I, I remember going through God, probably 20 years ago, I remember going through a really bad breakup and was in a lot of pain. And I remember I would go for literally like a, like a walking meditation almost every, every day in this park just to stay with sensation. And eventually it felt like a lot of it burned itself out. And then all of a sudden I, I could actually see it differently. Otherwise, I felt like I was trying to word my way out of it. And that never works because I'm not really being authentic with what I'm feeling. So there was a place where it's like, sometimes you have to stay with discomfort. And it, it's a really powerful um, process to learn to stay with discomfort, but without adding logs to the fire, without adding more to it, without creating meaning that's not really inherent, actually within it. And that process burns it out. And then I found like, when that starts to simmer down, 
now you can see it from a different perspective and it doesn't feel like you're trying to fake yourself into it you mm -hmm. literally can see now because it's like it's calmed down it's like you've you've maybe like climbed up the mountain a little bit more now you generally see the vista a little bit different okay. you can see parts of it that weren't there before so so then you actually have this very real sensation in the body i, I feel like that's a really important thing for everybody for all of us is to just be authentic like we got to be authentic within ourselves so like you had even said then we can show up authentically for other people you know it takes a lot sometimes to even be able to share what's come true for you your perspective to even share that with somebody else to give them an invitation to step into something else because a lot of times we're we get so concerned about how other people are going to take stuff and how we're going to you know are they going to like that are they not going to like it but it takes a lot of courage to be able to just be who you are even when other people are maybe not used to seeing it that way. So, but that's ultimately how I think we create lots of change. Yeah. Let, let's talk about what happens when someone has a really intense physical elemental response, overwhelmed with anger, overwhelmed with fear, you know, it complete, and it's completely un, not inauthentic to say, I'm not afraid because they are right. Yeah. So you, the first rule is always be authentic, but that authenticity has a little range within which you can work. Right. Yeah. So as an example, there's a story of a, a doctor who was in a dentist chair and the dentist gave them uh, an injection of lo a local painkiller into their jaw. Right. And when you do painkillers in the jaw, you mix a little bit of adrenaline in there and that closes the blood vessels and keeps the painkiller local. So it lasts longer. And the dentist screwed up and injected it into a blood vessel. And the adrenaline got right into the doctor's system. The doctor knew immediately what had happened. I've been ejected with adrenaline. Didn't change the fact that he had to run out of the chair screaming at the top of his lungs, having a panic attack. While he's aware that there's nothing to be afraid of, I only just got ejected with adrenaline. Didn't matter, screaming panic attack. So we have to recognize that we are affected very powerfully by these neurotransmitters. And if we get a strong enough dose, you know, you're going to have to be you know, a very powerful practitioner to hold out at bay or have a wickedly good uh, microbiome. <laughs> so if you find yourself in the middle of this really intense experience, recognize, you know, you, you don't want to suppress it. That's the word, you know, because then it'll, it, all it's going to do is bite you somewhere else where you can't see it. You always want to be present and conscious of these things, but find the range of experience. Like if you're really, really, really angry, well, how is there a little bit of variation in the anger you can feel? And to the degree that you can vary it and it be authentic, move it to the lighter side, right? And don't continue a narrative mm -hmm. that's making it worse. Like if you, if someone um, hit your car in traffic and ran off, right? Don't keep saying to yourself, I can't believe you did that. Why did you do that? What's wrong with it? And, and just go, just, you know, and, and you can't be like, oh, that's really inconvenient because now I'm going to have to go and get this thing fixed and it's going to cost me money and my insurance goes up. If you can't authentically go to inconvenience, feel the anger, but don't continue the storyline. Just feel the anger, breathe through it, watch it, observe it. And this is the right use of the space element. The right use of the space element is perspective. It's climbing up the mountain and seeing the vista, being surrounded by space, right? It's being able to see like, oh, you know, like kind of mentally back up, like, okay, I'm in my car, but my car is on the road, but my roads on the country, county, my county's in the country, the country's on a planet, the planet's in the solar system. And you back away long enough, you're like, oh my God, I'm such a tiny speck, this is insignificant, right? A little bit of that energy can pull you out of the other four elements. It can help you deal with the fear and attachment and the greed and the anger and all of these things and the sadness by backing up. Just realize that backing up is not the end of the journey. That just takes a person into you know, we don't, we're not here to emulate a rock, you know, go there just as much as you need to have enough perspective to be like, and wait it. I'm like, all right, this is my neurochemistry. I'm not going to fight it, but I'm not going to make it worse. Don't neither indulge nor suppress. And then, yeah, you know, there you go. Yeah. It's the thinking, the, the thinking you got to remember every time you think, you're actually creating the same neurochemistry when you're thinking in that process as what the original event did. It's kind of like when the the Buddha talked about with the different arrows, the first and then the second arrow. So the first arrow is the event that happens, and there's a very reality to what's going on with stuff. The second arrow is kind of what we keep shooting ourselves with when we go over and over mm -hmm. and over and and just keep. People can stay in those forever. I mean, think of something mm -hmm. like resentment. You can you can keep yourself in a field of resentment for your entire life.
And, you know, don't worry if you, if you get overwhelmed by an emotion and you can't keep it under control authentically, don't worry about it. That yeah. one was beyond your skill set at the moment, right? It's like, no, you're not going to bench press 500 times your first time in the gym. Trust me, you're going to have plenty more opportunities to have <laughs> inconvenient things come your way. So, Within the same day. <laughs> Within 20 minutes, something else inconvenient will come on, right? Yeah. You know, so just you will have plenty of opportunities all day long for the rest of your life to work with these elements. And if one big one comes along that's, that, that, that rolls you like a, like a wave when you're surfing, that's okay. You know, yeah. you get another chance. You'll, you'll get there. You will eventually, you will eventually get to the point where you can roll with it. Not yet. And that's cool. Maybe yeah. For the next one. Start off with, I always tell people, start off with the little ones, you know, practice when you, when you start to practice, don't jump into the big issues you've got with like your partner or your parents or your kids or something. Those, those are some big ones to try and tackle it. I think of it like going to the Olympics, you know, if you showed mm. up at the Olympics and never practiced, you're going to get blown away. You, you got to put your time in. So I think of it like practice with gentler things, like maybe like impatience, you know, like the lineups taking a little longer than you'd like it to. So get used to staying with like impatience um, and see if you can sit with that for a little while without it blowing you out of the water, you know, like, like dip your toes in, get, get mm -hmm. used to the, the sensation of making it in your body without adding to it. And, and then, then you kind of gradually keep building up like almost this kind of spiritual muscle to work with more and more stuff as we go along. A so, sense of humor is also really useful. You know, if you're in the wrong yeah. line and you switch to another line and suddenly that line's a long one and you go to another one and then somebody pulls out 500, a, a big roll of coupons <laughs> and you're like, oh, come on. And then someone starts paying with pennies. You know, it's like, <laughs> yes, boy, this is inconvenience. And I really would have preferred not to be late to my appointment. Um, but, but that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's really funny. The coupons and then the pennies and then there's yeah. a power outage. Wow. Okay. So, so <laughs> that's when laugh. you kind of have to look up and just like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Humor like changes context in a second. So yeah. it can totally change perspective. You see that people like the Dalai Lama and a lot of these spiritual gi giants have enormous senses of humor. That's in that time. That's uh, on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. That is a developed attribute. So that is a very good sign. That is a very powerful spiritual force to, to work with, to develop your sense of humor, you know? So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I know Dr. David Hawkins, who is a spiritual teacher, sense of humor was on his sort of top 10 list of things to develop, to, mm. to work with, basically to work with continual spiritual development. So mm. Spencer, that was, uh, that was awesome. I think we covered a ton of stuff there. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely get together and do a big one on the microbiome because I think I'm going to get emails on people wanting to hear more about that. Um, Spencer, where can people learn more about all of the work you're doing? I know you got lots of different videos. You got lots of cool products. Where can people learn more about the stuff you're doing? Uh, if you go to remedylink.com, all of our products are there. And there's a bunch of videos that uh, will express, you know, my perspective on how the body works and what you could do about it. Uh, and if you go to spiritualsecretagent.com, uh, there's a couple of uh, short works there that were the things that um, oxytocin taught me. <laughs> Various, you know, in terms of like relationships and how my mind works and things like that. Awesome. As usual, I'll have those in the show notes. People can check that work out. Spencer, that was great. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Jason. Take care. Yeah, you too.